It is now time for oral questions. I recognize the member for Waterloo. Thank you. What? <laughs> yeah, it was. Uh, um, first, Mr. Speaker, I just want to say on behalf of Andrea Horvath and Ontario's official opposition, we want to wish everyone a happy and healthy uh, Christmas season. Uh, my question is to the Premier. Uh, the Premier has not demonstrated the leadership uh, in Ontario that was needed during this pandemic. He opposed vaccine certificates to help small businesses. He planned on scrapping them in January, and businesses are still in the dark about their use. He refused new safety zones around health care facilities, even as people waded through anti-vax protesters just to get their children vaccinated. Nurses have called his refusal to mandate vaccine workers uh, in health care and education mandates cowardly. Nurses have said that. Speaker, this Premier has been caving to anti-vaxxers this entire time. Does the Premier not realize how dangerous it is to send these mixed messages question. out into the province of Ontario? And to reply to the question, the Premier. Well, well, thank, you, thank you so much to the uh, person across the aisle there, Mr. Speaker. But I'll, I'll tell you what uh, we have done, Mr. Speaker. In every single category, uh, we've had a robust plan, a robust plan that focuses on making sure that we're, we're focusing on getting people to the testing stations, getting people to get a rapid test. Mr. Speaker, we have distributed 34 million tests in 40,000 sites. 40,000 sites, 34 million tests. That's more than every single province and territory combined in the entire province. We're making sure that we get 11 million tests out to uh, the schools on packs of five. We're, pop we're putting pop-up uh, locations all in malls and shopping centers and in transit locations and workplaces Response. to make sure it's convenient for people to get tested. We are going to uh, focus on making sure we do everything we can to keep the people of Ontario safe. Supplementary question. Speaker, this Premier has not used this session to invest in the supports that people need in Ontario. He's diverted billions of dollars to two highways that pave over farmland, won't address congestion, and will be a waste of money. Under his watch, hundreds of millions of dollars in grants went to businesses that didn't even qualify for his own poorly designed program. He gave the 407 a billion dollar gift behind closed doors. Meanwhile, so many Ontarians and small businesses needed support during this pandemic, but the Premier did not show up for them. Why has this Premier spent billions of dollars on his buddies when so many Ontarians are getting are not getting the support that they need to make it through this pandemic with any integrity at all. Deputy Premier and Minister of Health. Thank you very much, Speaker, and thank you to the member opposite for the question. Our government has been focused on the health and well-being of Ontarians throughout this pandemic. We've spent over $5.1 billion since the start of this pandemic on increases to our health care system. Uh, we're putting in an additional $1.8 billion in 2021-22 in hospitals, and uh, we are supporting critical care capacity, investing in that $778 million to help hospitals keep pace with patient needs, $760 million to support hospitals with more than 3,100 extra beds, and $300 million to increase surgical and diagnostic procedures. That's the extent of the investments the, our government is making in the people of Ontario and the people's health of the province of Ontario. Final supplementary. Speaker, this Premier has cut base education funding in this fall economic statement by half a billion dollars. He did nothing to support it, support burned out frontline health care heroes, which has directly resulted in a staffing crisis in our health care system. It's meant crowded emergency rooms with long wait times and ICUs struggling to find staff to help patients during this challenging time. And this Premier refuses to, to do anything to address the crushing cost of living, thanks to his long-standing low-wage policies. Why hasn't the Premier put the people of Ontario first and ensured that they have the health and the education services they need to get through this pandemic? They deserve so much better. Minister of Education. Mr. Speaker, there is no government in the history of this province that is investing more in public education, in public health care than this Premier, this progressive Conservative government. We are doing so every single year. In every successive budget, we've increased investment. 
to hire more educators, to hire more frontline staff. Within public education alone, we are uh, on track to spend $200 million more million this year than we projected, which is already up $600 million. Speaker. We've allocated $1.6 billion for COVID resources. We lead the nation in ventilation investments, $600 million, 70,000 HEPA units. In Waterloo, in every region of Ontario, we have HEPA units in every single classroom in schools without mechanical ventilation. We now have expanded testing, the only province to send five take-home tests in a kit to protect the holidays and ensure children are safe upon the return in the new year. This is leadership. Spons. This is proactive action to reduce risk. We have the lowest cases in the nation, one of them, and one of the highest vaccine rates. We're going to continue to lead and protect this province. Thank you very, thank you very much. Um, my question is also to the Premier. Yesterday, the Minister of Health seemed to announce a brand new rapid antigen test policy right here in the legislature. She said, and I quote, people come to our pharmacies in order to receive the tests. These are free of charge to the people who need them, courtesy of the Government of Canada, providing a number of the tests. Well, Speaker, this was news to pharmacies, and it would be good news to Ontarians if the who have been stuck paying $40 when they go to a pharmacy to get one of the rapid antigen tests right now. That's what's happening in Ontario right now. Uh, in the Science Table's new report this morning, it's clear that rapid antigen tests are going to be an important tool in helping to keep Ontarians safe. That is the best advice that we have received. So just to confirm, will the minister announce today right here in this legislature, that this is Ontario's new policy, that anyone who wants a rapid test can walk into a pharmacy and get them free of charge. Thank you very much. Well, it, the science table a brief that was recently released essentially affirms Ontario's rapid testing strategy. Every week, over one million rapid tests are deployed to thousands of workplaces, hospitals, home and community care settings, long-term care homes, and schools and child care centres across the province. As of December 6, Ontario has distributed over 34 million tests, which is significantly more than all of the other provinces combined. In fact, Ontario has deployed nearly 60% of all rapid tests distributed in Canada. Mm -hmm. And for context, Quebec has deployed 5.7 million tests, and British Columbia has deployed 1.16 million tests. So we do have a wide array of rapid testing alternatives available in Ontario, free of charge to people who need them. The only time that people Response. are charged $40 is when they require a test for travel purposes. Other than that, if they're symptomatic, or asymptomatic but have been close to someone with COVID, they will receive a test free of charge. Supplementary. Speaker, the Premier's own staff told reporters that there are five billion tests still, still on shelves here in Ontario, waiting to be distributed. And experts have weighed in, saying that they want more rapid tests. The price of those tests shouldn't be a barrier. $40 is a barrier for many families. Dr. Uni, the head of the province's science table, said, and I quote, it makes sense from a scientific perspective to use rapid tests more frequently, to make rapid tests more available in this province. Speaker, it is clear from the science table that the more we can use rapid tests, the better. So why does the Premier have five million of these tests sitting in storage instead of making them freely available this holiday season when we are in a crisis with a new delta with a Question. new variant uh, there has never been a more important time actually to show some leadership and get those tests into the hands of ontarians premier so you you mr speaker uh, as the as the minister of health deputy premier uh, mentioned we are distributing a million every single week and if my opposition leader understands inventory control, that's going to last us about three to four weeks as we ramp up over a million a week. Again, we're going to malls, we're going to shopping centres, we're going to transit areas, we're going to workplaces, distributing all the rapid tests we can get out there. Again, if you add up all the provinces, as the Minister of Health mentioned, BC, a little over five million. We have Quebec, I'm sorry, BC a little over a million, Quebec over five million. 
We've distributed 34 million tests, 40,000 sites. We're going to have pop-up centres around the province so people can come in right from holiday markets, Mr. Speaker, to high transit areas. That's what we're focusing on. We're going to continue what? making sure that we don't let the well run dry and have zero. We need three or four million in stock at all times until the inventory flow. Thank works. you. Thank That's you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The final supplementary. I can, I can tell you, Speaker, that Ontarians aren't waiting for this government to get anything right. A, a local doctor from my area in Kitchener, Waterloo, has launched an online campaign to get tests to all households. Dr. Dahlia Hassan, an ICU doctor, said, and I quote, we want the provincial government to step up and deliver rapid tests to our community so that they can safeguard the public at large. That's what's at stake. Dr. Hassan has set up the Twitter account COVID Test Finders to help people get their hands on rapid tests. Her campaign is so popular that Twitter hashtag free the rats or rapid antigen tests was the number one trend in Canada yesterday. People are desperate. Why won't the Premier listen to the medical experts calling for more widespread rapid tests and make them freely Question. available across Ontario before the holidays? People are waiting for this kind of leadership. So much is at stake. Do your job. Remind the members to make their comments through the chair. Allow the Premier to reply. Sorry. Again, Mr. Speaker, I'm just going to repeat the numbers until it sinks in. 34 million tests. That's more than every single province and territory combined. We're distributing more than 60 percent of all the tests in the country. 34 million. 11 million tests, because of the great leadership of our Minister of Education, are going out to every single student's household. And they're in packs of five, so they can be used for their parents, their siblings, or their, their, anyone within the, the household. That's what you call proper distribution. We're getting our hands on every single rapid test there's available in the entire country, because we have a plan, we have a strong plan to get these out the door into households, into workplaces, into shopping malls and malls, and in any area that we have large volumes of pedestrians, we're going to be there to make sure the people of Ontario get tested. And the next question, number four, Toronto St. Paul's. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Our communities, our schools have been demanding safe schools since the beginning of this pandemic. Sadly, those calls have gone unanswered. For us in St. Paul, McMurray Junior Public School was also hit by closure. It closed from an outbreak, bringing the total number across Toronto schools to 28 as of this week. McMurray per parents and many others in our community have been calling for rapid tests for months. The member for Davenport and myself have written to the government amplifying this request. It was only once the outbreak was reported that support was received. Too little, too late. Speaker, my question is to the Premier. Sending students homes with tests through the break is not enough. What about January, February, March, April, May, June? What is this government doing to rebuild trust in parents, question. teachers, and education workers that sending kids back to school in the new year will in fact be safe? Thank you. Minister of Education. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. We have extended second-term funding of over $300 million under the Premier's leadership to ensure we hire more staff, to ensure our schools remain safe. We've stepped up investment in every school in St. Paul's, without exception, has better air ventilation because we got ahead of this virus by investing before September in improvements writ large, 60, actually 70,000 HEPA units within classrooms. That's making a meaningful difference. In fact, the science table acknowledged that in their last report. With respect to rapid tests, we are the only province in the nation to send home rapid tests on a proactive basis announced before Omicron even entered our shores because we are working and safeguarding the children every step of the way. We've expanded testing. We have PCR take-home tests to make lives easier for families. And we've hired 2,000 additional educators, EAs, ECEs. These are making a difference. Five and six schools in this province right now at the peak of this wave have no active what? cases. We take nothing for granted, and I share the members' concern. We're doing every Everything possible to protect our children, keep them safe, and keep our community strong, and we'll continue to. Thank you very much. <laughs> Supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. What the member in the government side doesn't realize is if McMurray's calls were answered months ago, 
the school probably wouldn't have gotten closed. My question is to the Premier. As kids were home last week from Monday to Friday, many parents were also forced to stay home and oversee their virtual loan learning without another option. While this government extended their broken paid sick days program, it still only covers three days. Speakers, some of our parents needed five days, other parents needed 14 days to stay home with kids who were sick quarantining. For those without paid sick days, like the parent who works as a contractor and plumber who contacted me, that means it hit their family's income. Speaker, through you, can the Premier explain why parents in St. Paul's and across Ontario at that are expected to take an income loss when they must stay at home with their sick children for the sake of our collective health and safety. Thank you, Speaker. Government House Leader, to reply. Speaker, I, it was uh, announced just, that just the other day that we were going to continue the supports that we put in place for, uh, uh, for workers right through uh, to, uh, to July, Mr. Uh, Mr. Speaker. We know, uh, we've known right from the beginning that we had to put uh, supports in place for individuals during COVID. It is an extraordinary time. You've just heard the, uh, the Minister of Education highlight some of the uh, nationwide leading uh, uh, investments that we've made to keep our students safe, but at the same time, the Premier knew right from the beginning that we had to keep our workers and our essential workers safe, Mr. Speaker. That is why he negotiated an over $1 billion uh, program of support for our workers. There were some gaps in that that we had hoped would have been filled by a, a federal budget. When that wasn't the case, uh, we stepped in to ensure that workers had access to uh, additional paid sick days to close, uh, to close that gap. Uh, uh, and as I said, the uh, Minister of Labour Spons. and the Premier have announced that uh, that will continue right through to the end of July. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Next question, the member for Aurora Oak Ridges, Richmond Hill. Well, thank you very much, Speaker. My question is to the great Minister of Energy. Minister, it was great to hear you speaking so highly of the nuclear power that has offered Ontario in this House just a couple of weeks ago. Speaker, I'm proud to be a part of a government that has been a strong advocate for the nuclear sector. And we all know that clean and reliable electricity generated by nuclear facilities will be needed to continue powering Ontario's families and businesses in the years and decades ahead. Minister, can you tell us what you and your, our government are doing to increase Ontario's capacity to generate emissions-free, low-cost and reliable electricity? And to reply, Minister of Energy. Thanks very much, and thanks to the great member for the great question. Our Premier and our government have never been shy about our support for nuclear power. And that's why it was such a pleasure. It was such a pleasure last week to be able to join OPG on World Nuclear Energy Day as we announced some incredible news for Ontario and the world, Mr. Speaker. The selection of OPG's technology partner for the Darlington SMR project. The announcement positions Ontario to be a global leader in new nuclear technologies like small modular reactors that represent tremendous economic and environmental opportunities for our province, our country, and the world. Mr. Speaker. Nuclear power is already the backbone of our energy system here in Ontario, providing 60 per cent of our baseload every day. It's reliable, it's competitively Spons. priced, and it's clean power, Mr. Speaker. And by building on our nuclear capacity, we're continuing our global leadership, and we're on our pathway to net zero emissions. Supplementary question. Thank you very much, and through you, uh, Speaker, I want to thank the Minister for that excellent answer. And that's really fantastic news for, for Ontarians, and I'm really glad to hear that our province is continuing to lead the way on this exciting new technology. Speaker, while the Liberals squandered Ontario's clean energy advantage and drove jobs out of this province, our government is restoring that advantage and building on it. Minister, you mentioned that this project has a number of benefits to offer beyond just generating emissions-free, low-cost and reliable electricity. Can you tell this House more about what the small modular reactor project at Darlington will do for the region and Ontario's economy as a whole? Again, Canada's nuclear sector already supports 76,000 jobs in the nuclear sector here in Ontario and an expert supply chain, 220 companies in the supply chain here in Ontario. Operational and regulatory experience here in Ontario means our province can be a first mover on this cutting-edge technology, and that's really important. It means even more good-paying jobs in the Durham region, Ontario's clean energy capital. But 
but in communities across the province that are home to supply chain companies like Port Hope and Peterborough and yeah. Cambridge. and yeah. Really, they're all across Ontario, Mr. Speaker. And there's a lot of interest from our colleagues in Saskatchewan, New Brunswick, and Alberta, and other provinces and jurisdictions around the world. I can tell you, Speaker, that the world is watching what's happening at Darlington right now with this small modular reactor. It was the talk of the town in Paris, France, last week at the World Nuclear Exhibition. Thank you very much. The next question, the member for Parcel High Park. My question is to the Premier. Speaker, a child care report revealed yesterday that if the government doesn't sign a child care deal by early next year, the province will lose a billion dollars in funding. That's money the province could use right now to lower fees for parents. Ontario is the only province without a deal, and if a billion dollars of funding isn't big enough a carrot, Speaker, I'm not sure what is actually going to compel this government to get a deal done. It's been 233 days since the federal government announced program details, and this government's stalling has led to a billion dollars worth of funding being at stake. Can the government assure parents that a deal will be signed as soon as possible so that this funding is not lost? Minister of Education. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I want to thank the member opposite for the question. We would both agree that the legacy inherited under the former Liberal government is indefensible. 400 per cent increase in child care costs. All of our constituents pay that price. Every mother and father today pays the price for their inaction. Parents deserve better. In the first budget, our government introduced a Ontario child care tax credit, which, yes, incrementally makes life more affordable. Regrettably, for New Democrats and Liberals, you oppose that measure. When the Premier allocated a billion dollars to build 30,000 more childcare spaces, which are accessible and, more importantly, affordable, New Democrats and Liberals coalesced to oppose it. Now, this government is committed to getting a deal, yes, as soon as possible. We provide the financials to the feds. They know what we need to get to $10. If they have the political will, they will respond in kind, get this deal wrapped up so that we can make childcare finally affordable after the 40 percent increase over the national average under the adult. Duke of Liberals. Mr. Speaker, Response? we've made the case for affordability. We're going to stand up for Ontario and get the best deal, a fair deal for the families we serve. Back to the Minister. Speaker, continued delays hurt families. The report showed what most of us in this House already know. If a couple with two children cannot access subsidies, licensed childcare at any income is remarkable. Stop the clock. Stop the clock. Apologize to the member for Park Delhi Park. The member for York Centre must come to order. Please restart the clock again. I recognize the member for Park Hill High Park. Speaker, the report showed what most of us in this House already know. If a couple with two children cannot access subsidies, licensed childcare at any income level is remarkably unaffordable. Infant spaces in Toronto average $85 a day or about $1,700 a month. Parents are paying the price for this government's inaction. That's not fair or right. Speaker, again to this government, a billion dollars' worth of funding is at stake. Life-changing money for families in Parkdale Hyde Park and across Ontario. Will they get the deal done? Minister of Education. Uh, Mr. Speaker, every single year, New Democrats and Liberals vote against roughly $400 million in direct financial relief to parents to the Ontario Child Care Tax Credit, which was enriched by the Minister of Finance in the last budget. That's half a billion dollars over three years. That makes a difference in savings directly to support parents in Ontario. Now, in the words of the, um, the uh, Executive Director of the Association of Daycare Operators of Ontario, they said, quote, there are practical reasons why the Ford government needs to keep working to get Ontario's child care deal right. Ontario isn't just Ontario. Ontario isn't just Canada's most populous province. It's one of the fastest growing and most diverse. Its child care system is more complex. In addition to government-run kindergarten facilities and child care owned by municipalities, there's a mix of large non-profit institutions. These small businesses account for 25 percent of our operators. Most are women-owned. Arriving at an assessment that includes all of these service providers may take some time, Response? but respecting Ontario families means the deal needs to be flexible enough to support all of them, to expand the range of options to support them. No government should be criticized for working towards this goal. We'll continue to work in good faith to land a good deal, a fair deal for Ontario families. Next question, the member for York Centre. Mayor Christmas Speaker, my question is to the Premier. 
Almost four years later, the Premier broke almost every major promise he campaigned on. He campaigned on ending health care, but we now have less health care capacity and less health care workers. He campaigned on lowering hydro rates by 12 percent, but hydro rates are up. He's running a global adjustment on steroids funded by the taxpayer. He promised to restore accountability to government, but he passed the Crown Liability Proceedings Act and used the notwithstanding clause to overrule the court to give himself an electoral advantage. He said he'll reduce car insurance rates. Yeah, right. Premier said we won't have autism parents protesting on the lawn of Queen's Park, but he dismantled the autism program, and the wait list is up from 23,000 kids to more than 50,000 kids. Will the Premier have courage to admit that on the items I just listed, it's promises made, promises broken? And to respond, yeah. Government House Leader. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Uh, well, when I look at uh, the province of Ontario, uh, I look at how we compare to every other jurisdiction with respect to our fight against uh, COVID. I am proud of the people of the province of Ontario, and I'm proud of most of the members of the provincial parliament who have stood with us to fight COVID. But, Mr. Speaker, it's so much more. I look at the Minister of Transportation, the things that she is doing to bring transit opportunities across Toronto, the Ontario line. I am going to have a subway into York Region, something that we have fought for for so long. We're getting it done. I look at the Minister of Health and the investments that she is making to increase critical care and ICU capacity, something that should have been done ages ago. It is getting done. I look at the Minister for Long-Term Care, 30,000 beds, 27,000 new PSWs, and I look at the Minister of Finance and I say to myself, here is an economy that is roaring back to life. We've We've uh, taken all of the jobs that Response. we've lost, and we've added 100,000 new jobs with thousands left to be filled. I look at a province of promise, Mr. Speaker, despite— Thank you. Thank you. The supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. Actually, the Premier campaigned on the Shepherd subway. He didn't campaign on the Ontario line. And the Ontario line is not even hard rail. I don't think that anyone told the Premier that it's not an actual subway. But, Speaker, no wonder the Premier gave the House Leader a $27,000 raise, but he can't get away with it. Hydro rates, promise broken. End hallway health care, promise broken. Restore accountability to government, promise broken. Reduce auto insurance rate, promise broken. Fix autism, promise broken. The Premier who campaigned on efficiencies and gravy trains is now doing a Liberal giveaway tour. He's the conductor of the gravy train. But there's no greater promise broken than when they told Ontarians that when we had 70, 80, 90 percent that will go back to normal and that will get to do things we get to enjoy. We've never done, we've done what was asked of us, Speaker, and 90 percent of us are vaccinated, but the promise is broken. Did the Premier knowingly Question. break this promise, or will he finally admit that they never had an exit strategy? Government House Leader. Mr. Speaker, I, I, I think. Uh, this member's questions confirm for me that one of the best decisions this Premier made was asking this member to leave our caucus and go sit as an independent, Mr. Speaker. I, uh, I think that uh, shines through every order. Can government House Leader respond. Member for York Centre, come to order. Member for York Centre will come to order. Government House Leader has the floor. Respond. <laughs> He says it's always personal for me. Well, yes, actually, it is personal for me because I actually ran in this place to make a difference, Mr. Speaker. I ran because I didn't like what was happening to the province of Ontario. So is it personal for me? Yes, it is personal for me. Is it personal for me when the member stands up and talks down all of the things that will help us get out of COVID, Mr. Speaker? Yes, it's personal for me. It's personal for me as it is to all of the members on this side and most of the members on that side. We may disagree once in a while, Mr. Speaker, Response. but I can tell you this. The members of this House, most of the members of this House, have seen Ontario become one of the best jurisdictions in its fight against COVID and an economy that is roaring back to life despite that member. But after June 2nd, we won't have to worry about it. <laughs> The next order. The next question. Next question. The member for Renfrew, Nipissing, Pembroke. Thank you very much, Speaker. And before I turn my question to the Minister of Agriculture, Rural and Food and Rural Affairs, I want to wish our son Zachary a 43rd birthday today, and yesterday our grandson Leopold a, a sixth birthday. To the Minister, this week we have seen several announcements related to the expansion of broadband connectivity throughout southwestern Ontario. Essex and Middlesex counties have received news this week that construction of new broadband infrastructure is now underway. 
and thousands of households will soon have access to fast, reliable broadband. I know that constituents in, my, in rural parts of my riding are often frustrated by the lack of reliable internet connectivity. So, Speaker, through you to the Minister, what steps are being taken by the province to connect more Ontarians to fast, reliable, high-speed internet? Mr. Mayor, Culture, Food, and World Affairs. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and I'd like to thank the member from Renfrew, Nipissing, Prembrook for that important question, because our government has made access to high-speed internet an absolute priority, and we're walking our talk. With another example, just this past week, we announced more than 1,400 homes, businesses, and farms in the Essex, Middlesex County region will be receiving high-speed access. You know, this is representing a $6.2 million infrastructure investment, upgrades that are badly needed, and our government is seeing this through. You know, there's going to be additional good news coming throughout the holiday season for our communities throughout rural Ontario because we're demonstrating that we are absolutely committed to nearly $4 billion of infrastructure investment so every community in this province can have confidence that they have high-speed internet Response. and this is the largest single investment of high-speed internet in any province made in canada in history and we have our thank you thank you very much <laughs> supplementary well thank you very much speaker and uh, back to the minister these announcements and this government's investments in broadband and cellular technology are undoubtedly positive for Ontario's rural families and businesses. However, I know from the farmers in my riding that agriculture is a 21st century business at the forefront of new innovations, and in order to remain competitive, Ontario's farmers need access to this type of infrastructure as well. Speaker, through you, can the Minister of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs tell us what targeted investments in broadband infrastructure will do to support Ontario's agricultural and agri-food businesses. Excellent. Thank you. Mr. Agriculture. Very good. Well, thank you, Speaker. And I appreciate the focus on farmers because while high-speed access is very important to small business and families throughout rural Ontario, our farmers are early adapters of the digital world and, and new technologies because we have to remain competitive. And we need this access that our government is providing because, Speaker, farming has changed. Today, Farmers are embracing the digital world, managing on a daily basis their nutrients. They're improving animal husbandry. They are looking to improve feed conversions and ultimate overall efficiencies. So we're producing top quality food right here at home that Ontarians can have confidence in. You know, our government's investment in broadband and cellular access will absolutely enable farmers across this province to be outstanding in their field Response. but i can tell you the innovations adopted in greenhouses as well are just helping our sector lead by example and ontarians this christmas season and through the holidays can have every confidence that they have great quality ontario grown food close to home thank you, thank you. Next question, Mr. thank you very much speaker uh, speaker i recently told the premier that Sudbury had 218 opioid overdose memorial crosses, and now we have five more. One of the new crosses erected by Rick Como. Rick recently lost his granddaughter, Tashana, to an overdose. Rick told me that Tashana was very enthusiastic. She described her as so sweet, happy-go-lucky, and loving, but the addictions were just too strong. Tashana was 27 years old. She leaves behind a seven-year-old son and a three-year-old baby girl. The family's devastated. To Shannon's mom, speaker is in deep sorrow. She's full of guilt, even though she knows she did everything she could to help her daughter. My community mourns with Rick and his family. Last November, there were 51 opioid overdose memorial crosses in Sudbury. Two weeks ago, there were 218. Today, there are 223. My question today is the same as before. How many more crosses will we have to erect before the Premier takes action on opioid addictions in Sudbury? The Associate Minister of Mental Health and Addictions. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker, and, and thank you for the question from the member opposite. You know, Mr. Speaker, we know that Ontarians across the province of Ontario are fighting to beat their addictions, and we know many of them have been reaching out for help. That isn't any difference in, in anywhere in the province of Ontario. And our government firmly believes that every Ontarian deserves 
to be fully supported in their journey from prevention to recovery. And that's why, Mr. Speaker, we announced $32.7 million in new annualized funding for targeted addiction services and supports, including treatment and care for opioid use disorder. Mr. Speaker, these investments include $6.9 million in provincial opioid response investments, such as harm reduction supplies and supports over $18.8 million in bed-based investments for adults and youth who need intensive supports, including adding 30 new youth treatment beds at Pine Response. River Institute, adding new adult addiction treatment beds as well throughout the province. Thank you. Thank you. Supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. Back to the Premier. Rick has a lot of experience with addictions. He's recovered from drug and alcohol addiction, and he's worked as an addiction, addictions counselor for 35 years. Rick was devastated when the police showed up at his door to tell him that his granddaughter, Tashana, was dead. Rick told me, if fentanyl was out when I was hooked on heroin, I would have died. It's Russian roulette every time you use. Rick said trying to get help is like getting a slap in the face. When people are ready for treatment, they have to wait three, six, nine months, and this stuff is killing people every day. We need places that they can help them today, not tomorrow. They can't wait. If you make them wait, they'll die. Right now, there's no help for them. I asked Rick what Sudbury needs. He said, supervised injection sites, and we need an opioid treatment center in Sudbury. He said the Premier must know that the North needs help too, not just in the South. My question, Speaker, to the Premier, how many more young people like Tashana have to die from overdose in Sudbury before the Premier finally decides to help Sudbury? Consortium Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And once again, I thank the member opposite for that question. Mr. Speaker, we're very well aware of the issues relating to addictions and overdoses. We are building through the Roadmap to Wellness a continuum of care to look after the needs of individuals because we know that treatment and recovery are an important part of the continuum of what needs to be done. And Mr. Speaker, we're not just talking about it as previous governments have and done absolutely nothing because I'm here because of the fact that the previous government did nothing and our government has invested to date annually $525 million, and we will continue working to build continuums of care, working with the service providers, and ensuring that individuals that need the help get the help where and when they need it, not having to travel to different parts of the province. This is something that we've taken into account, and if you look at the Roadmap to Wellness, Response. you'll see that those services are being placed throughout the province of Ontario and in remote areas, utilizing other mechanisms to deliver those services. Thank you. Next question, the member for Ottawa South. Thank you very much, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. Speaker, despite what the Minister, the Premier, and their offices say, the rats still aren't free. Rapid antigen tests are not free at drugstores. They cost $40 a test compared to Nova Scotia, New Brunswick, Saskatchewan, UK, and Germany who are providing them for free. They should be widely available and free for people. They should have been in the hands of parents in September, yet it's December and it's, they're still not in the hands of parents. That's incredible. So, Speaker, through you, when will this government finally move to make rapid antigen tests free for all families here in Ontario and get them in their hands? Minister of Health. Thank you very much. Well, the tests are free and are available to the people of Ontario. The only time that people need to pay $40 for tests is when they need it for travel purposes. But if they're symptomatic or asymptomatic and having been in contact with someone with COVID, they will be able to receive these tests free of charge. So where they are available as more people head indoors and attend family meetings over the winter months, access to publicly funded COVID-19 PCR, specimen collection select pharmacies, providing take-home PCR self-collection kits for eligible individuals, allowing them to pick them up and return the specimens to the pharmacies, expanding ID now and rapid PCR testing to select assessment centers and pharmacies across Northern Ontario, bringing asymptomatic testing directly to Ontario with pop-up testing sites in higher traffic public settings to provide vaccine education and help reduce the risk of transmission over the holidays. In addition to all of that, there are going to be rapid tests that are going to be distributed to every school child, thanks Spons? to the Minister of Education. They will have five tests to take home, which can be used. These are rapid tests that are going to make sure that our children are safe when they return to school and over the holidays. Supplementary question. 
Speaker, the minister appreciates the difference between a rapid test and a PCR test that can take two days. Now, I appreciate, though, the fact that the minister is here every day to answer questions and that she doesn't see question period as a 22-minute, one-day-a-week endeavour. So here's the thing. Scott Moe, Scott Moe, Scott Moe has set the rats free at all the co-op stores in Saskatchewan. And you know why he's done that? Because he knows it's important to get into the hands of people. That's why he freed the rats in Saskatchewan, and that's why we need to do it here. Come inside, come to order. They cost pennies to make, except the government and the premier and the minister are satisfied that some family may have to go to Shoppers Drug Mart and pay 40 bucks because they need a rapid test, and they don't have another option because it's not available to them. That's what happens. And if it happens to one family, it's too many, and it's been happening to more families than that. So what does the minister and this government think about a test costing, a rapid test costing $40 in this province? Someone's charging $40 for a test that they're giving away for free in Saskatchewan. Tell me, Minister, what does this government think about that? I haven't heard you say a word about that. Stop the clock for a minute, please. Uh, Minister of Health, please. I've, I've stopped the clock for a minute to allow the uh, government members to stop heckling. Now that they've stopped, we'll start the clock again and allow the Minister of Health to answer. Thank you. We have already distributed over 34 million rapid tests across the province of Ontario. These are all being deployed in many Order. locations as requested. They're being deployed in schools, they're being deployed in hospitals, in congregate settings, in long-term care settings, at work. People who require them can receive them through the uh, provincial portal or through their local chamber of commerce. They are widely distributed, so much so that I actually wrote to my federal counterpart, Minister Duclos, last week asking the federal government to please approve more types of rapid tests so that we can distribute them even more. That is something that the minister has agreed to do. Ottawa will soon be delivering a larger number of rapid tests, so we are distributing everything that we have and over a million a week is a significant Spons? deployment of rapid tests. Here, here. Okay, the next question, the member for Bruce Gray Owen Sound. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Finance. I want to commend him for the stellar and balanced job he has done stewarding the needs of people and providing financial support to the people of Ontario during the pandemic. Speaker, as we all know, Ontario has faced a once-in-a-lifetime crisis that placed an incredible burden on our health care system, our economy, our families, and our communities. I remain proud that in the face of these unprecedented challenges, the people of Ontario have shown true compassion, resolve, and Ontario spirit. Through you, Speaker, can the Minister of Finance tell us how the government is planning to ensure that all Ontarians have done and endured will continue to contribute to combating COVID-19? Thank you, Speaker. Mr. Finance. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Bruce Gray Owen Sound for that terrific question. He's right about Ontarians' compassion and resolve. Mr. Speaker, that's why Bill 43, the uh, Build Ontario Act, our first pillar, is protecting our progress because we're going to ensure that our frontline health care heroes have the resources they need, Mr. Speaker, by saying yes to investing over $1.8 billion to support 3,100 beds, reduce surgical and diagnostic imaging backlogs, and help hospitals keep pace with patient needs. And yes to adding and upscaling over 5,000 registered nurses and registered practical nurses and 8,000 personal support workers to our hospital and health care system. And, Mr. Speaker, yes to expanding home and community care by investing $548 million over three years to help hospitalized patients continue their recovery and rehabilitation at home. Mr. Speaker, we are saying yes to fixing the years of neglect by the previous Liberal government in our health care and our long-term care system, Mr. Right. Speaker. The supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. My thanks to the Minister of Finance for that response and for the representation he provides to the people of Pickering Uxbridge every single day. Speaker, in his role as President of the Treasury Board, he did in-depth analysis, and he noted, as he did in his comments, that the health care system faced long years of neglect under the previous Liberal government, who again and again said no to building an Ontario for the future. So, Speaker, through you. Could the Minister of Finance tell us how this government is balancing working towards Ontario's long-term prosperity while also protecting our progress? 
Mr. Yeah. Mr. Speaker, thank you again for the member for that question. Uh, the member is right. Ontario needs a plan that looks to the future. Uh, that's why the second pillar of our fall economic uh, statement and, and fiscal update is building Ontario. Previous governments said no, but we are saying yes to fighting gridlock and building the Bradford Bypass and the 413, yeah, yeah. and over 400 projects in our highways and rehabilitation renewal program. Yes to working with First Nations, yeah, yeah. working with uh, the northern communities to build the roads that will unlock the uh, economic potential of the Ring of Fire, and yes to shovels yes, in the ground yes. to create jobs yes, yes. and build the housing, long-term care capacity, and public transit that Ontario needs. Mr. Speaker, we know that tomorrow's prosperity depends on getting shovels in the ground today. That's why we have a plan, Respond. a plan to build Ontario, a plan to support Ontarians by growing the province as the best place to do business, to work, and to raise a family. Yes. The next question, the member uh, Speaker, uh, uh, My question is to the Premier. Public statements uh, by this government often uh, reveal a deeply uninformed perspective uh, on the Indigenous people who have always lived on these lands and on whose backs the Crown and non-Indigenous people have disproportionately benefited. Statements, uh, these statements are uh, out of step with reconciliation, out of step with modern legal developments and out of step, Speaker, in keeping with the constitutional mandate of the honour of the Crown. Speaker, uh, will Ontario ensure that advancement of development in Treaty 9 territory will only take place with the free, prior and informed consent of all First Nations affected. Miigwech. The member for Peterborough Kawartha and parliamentary assistant. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Our government takes the duty to consult very seriously, and that's why we have engaged in conversations with all First Nations. We'll continue to ensure that we meet our obligation of consultation as we move forward. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And the supplementary question. <clears throat> Back to the Premier. Speaker, uh, the, Premier, the Premier has publicly stated on numerous occasions that the Ring of Fire mining development is going ahead no matter what. We're doing it. I'll, I'll, if I have to hop on the bulldozer myself, those are the kind of comments we hear. These st statements reflect this government's intent whether the people of Treaty No. 9 consent or consider it safe and fair to do so. This is the very essence of colonialism, Speaker. How can the Premier possibly know what's best for a place he won't even visit? Will Ontario listen to the people who are worried about this project, you know, that a project that will change their ways of life permanently and commit to today to a consultation process in the Ring of Fire based on free, prior, and informed consent. Member for Peterborough Quartha. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Our government has engaged in consultation throughout this entire process. That's why we were able to, to sign an historic agreement with Martin Falls and Webequay First Nations for a permanent pathway, roadway into those communities so they don't rely on winter roads moving forward. In addition to that, Mr. Speaker, our government has met with, uh, just this past week, uh, with the leadership of Mishkegwig to continue that ongoing conversation with them to make sure that we have that prior informed consent as we move forward with this. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And the next question, the member for Durham. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Energy. As we look ahead to 2022 and do the reflection that comes with entering a new calendar year, many countries and world economies will be reflecting on not only the status of the pandemic, but also climate change and the future of energy use. 
The reality is most grids struggle to handle the intermittent nature of renewable sources, such as solar and wind energy, so more reliable baseload power is needed that is not coal-fired. Many predict the natural, that natural gas will have a comeback and there will be a global rehabilitation of nuclear power, which is greenhouse gas-free. Can the minister share his vision for the future of energy in Ontario? Minister of Energy. Well, thank you very much to the member opposite. And uh, first of all, I'd like to congratulate her on her recent wedding, Mr. Speaker, and uh, welcome, welcome to the club. <laughs> I know that uh, I know that the member uh, from Durham is very passionate about Ontario power generation, and Durham is the clean energy capital of Canada, Mr. Speaker. Over 6,000 megawatts of clean, reliable, affordable electricity come out of that region every year. In Pickering and Darlington's uh, facilities. And uh, we know that uh, that is what has allowed us to shut down coal plants, Mr. Speaker. It's our investment into facilities like Darlington and the rehab that's going on there, the refurbishment, and at Bruce Power as well, the world's largest nuclear power plant over on Lake Huron, Mr. Speaker. 60% of our power every day of our electricity comes from those facilities here in Ontario. We are a leader in that area, Fox. and that's why last week we were able to make the announcement in her riding where OPG has selected GE Hitachi to build the first new nuclear since 1993, something that is going to help other jurisdictions around the world do what we have done in Ontario. Thank you very much. The supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. And it was a great announcement to hear last week that OPG is moving forward and choosing GE Hitachi as its technology partner to build the first grid-scale small modular reactor in Canada at Darlington. This technology has potential to be deployed to more areas of Canada and the world than can do reactors and at a better price point. The emerging world accounts for two-thirds of energy-related carbon emissions, yet lacks the cash and innovation base to invest or invent its way to a cleaner energy system. We have that nuclear innovation base in Ontario. What's the plan to get it to market? Minister of Energy. <laughs> so excited about this project, Mr. Speaker, and I know the member opposite it is as well. This is the BWRX 300. It's a boiling water reactor that's going to be built right there on site at Darlington. The key thing about this project, and the world is watching this project because it has first mover status, meaning we have the environmental assessments, we have the Canadian Nuclear Safety Commission that's approved this site for the first new nuclear small modular reactor that's going to be built there. This is going to be a tremendous opportunity for jurisdictions around the world to get off carbon, clean up their emissions, and hit the targets uh, that they've set uh, in Paris and in other forums, Mr. Speaker. Uh, but particularly about this project, uh, GE Hitachi already has about 100 employees here in the House Leaders riding in, in Markham. Uh, they're going to increase that to 700 employees in the wow. development stage. Wow. And then for the construction of the project in the members riding, 1,700 um, individuals wow. will be working on that project. There are already 76,000 people working in our nuclear sector in Ontario. This project is only going to grow that, and we'll be able to export this small modular reactor around the world. The impact on our GDP is going to be astronomical, Mr. Speaker. I'm excited. About it. Next question, the member for St. Catharines. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. As you know, I believe there are times when the government and the opposition can and must work closely together, and times when we must raise our voices loudly against policy failures. Seniors in Niagara are left waiting for their booster shots when we know that they are vital to fighting the new variants. Niagara Public Health is prioritizing vaccinating children. I support that. However, it has put pressure on the pharmacies across Niagara to deliver booster shots to seniors quickly. Throughout the pandemic, Niagara Public Health and pharmacists have been heroes and continue to be. However, they can use much-needed support. We ramped up the capacity before. Looking at the Omicron variant and, and the incoming Christmas holidays, if this government is serious about the booster efforts and vaccinating children, will you ramp up capacity so seniors in Niagara that want a booster before the holidays can get it? 
Government House Leader. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I appreciate the, the, the question. As you know, we've, uh, we have uh, ramped it up, uh, in fact, Mr. Speaker. Uh, and to the credit of the people of the province of Ontario, we've hit 90 per cent uh, with respect to the first uh, and almost 90 per cent uh, on second doses. And as the Minister of Education has highlighted on a number of occasions, use from 5 uh, to 11, uh, I think we're approaching over 25 per cent who have uh, who have received their uh, their first dose. We also were one of the first jurisdictions to actually start initiating booster shots. Uh, recently, the age was lowered uh, to 50. We have had a groundbreaking effort across the province of Ontario. Part of the massive investments that we've made, the member is right that we are offering these booster shots across multiple platforms. Uh, we've gone into long-term care homes to make sure that they were uh, uh, given the first boosters. They're available at uh, at, uh, at pharmacies. We will continue this effort and continue these investments so that not only uh, uh, the good people of Niagara, but across the province, we can continue to get not only the boosters, but get our kids uh, uh, vaccinated, double vaccinated, Speaker, and maybe surpass even that 90%, which is a world leading figure right now. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. Back to the Premier. My team is scrambling to find open booster appointments for seniors that just want to be safe before Christmas holidays. Anyone who struggles to find one, you can reach out to me directly in Niagara. But it is getting harder and harder to find appointments. One predominant pharmacy in Niagara is already booking well into January. I have heard from seniors that have called around to every pharmacy before just giving up and hanging up. Monday's expanded eligibility will make this worse, Speaker. Ontario has the supply. There are solutions the government could act on, but they haven't. Seniors are stuck waiting and waiting because Ford's poor planning yet again. They've been waiting weeks already, and they still have to wait longer to finally Question. get their booster. Even as families are getting together over the holidays. Will this government act and treat seniors fairly by ramping up capacity today? House yeah, speaker, we, we actually have done just that. Uh, the member will know that when we expanded eligibility, it is still based on when you received your first dose. Uh, somebody like me who, uh, well, while not a senior yet, Mr. Speaker, uh, I won't be eligible to get my, uh, my booster uh, into, uh, into January. Uh, uh, speaker, to me, it is... Wonderful news. It is wonderful news to hear that so many people are lining up to get their boosters, Mr. Speaker. This is really good news because we keep hearing from the opposition that somehow people aren't doing it because it's hard for them to do so. But what I'm hearing from the from the member opposite is is that our efforts are working and they're paying off, and that this 90% target that we have right now we are going to exceed and surpass. That is wonderful news, and I do encourage people. Keep Fox? booking, keep booking. We will keep making sure that not only do we have vaccines from the federal government, but that we have somewhere for you to get that and people of Ontario can remain safe. Next question, the member for Scarborough Guildwood. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. You now, Speaker, this is but one of my last two questions I can ask this government before the year is out. My riding of Scarborough Guildwood has been a COVID hotspot for two years now. And with the new variant of concern ripping through schools and the community, people in my riding are concerned and they're really looking to this government for action. Speaker, with the rise of this, this Omicron uh, variant now, it's the cases we see are going up and up and up. And Ontarians and the people of Scarborough Guildwood are expecting action. No one wants to see schools and businesses close. No one wants another lockdown. Yet with 1,290 cases today, Speaker, what are the actions that this Question. Premier and his government are planning to take and has yet not been announced to make the holidays safe for families? Will his government provide leadership and guidance before it is too late? What measures are you planning to strengthen and to prevent a holiday bump in 2022? Minister of Education. Mr. Speaker, we obviously are taking action to keep families safe. Uh, we share a broad level of concern about the Omicron variant, which is precisely why the Minister of Health, the Premier, and our entire government has announced over the holidays there will be asymptomatic testing pop-up clinics across the province of Ontario. Within our school setting, before Omicron even came to this country, we announced the proactive deployment of five rapid antigen tests for every child in every school, public and private, to ensure communities are safe upon the return. We've announced the extension of Term 2 funding, $300 million more dollars to provide more staffing and stability within our schools, and we continue 
to improve the ventilation of the schools, over $600 million. We're doing it in partnership uh, with various ministers in this government to ensure their standards are improved right across Spons? Ontario. 70,000 HEP units are in place as we speak, as they were in September when school commenced. We'll continue to work with the Chief Medical Officer of Health to do everything possible to keep these school settings as safe as possible. Supplementary. Speaker, back to the minister. And with the warnings that the science table has already suggested, that by mid January, we will be at 3,000 cases without factoring in the Omicron variant. Why is this government reluctant to proactively do what eventually you must do? So I have understood in this House many times, I have stood in this House many times asking this government for vaccine equity for hotspot communities like mine in Scarborough Guildwood. We are again facing a rise in cases, and action is needed to protect people in these hotspots. We need vaccinations in schools during school hours. We need okay. fairness for families. And, Speaker, we are running out of time to implement these measures before the holiday break. Will the minister make boosters available to those 18 and over in hotspot communities now? Mr. Education. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. We are very committed to expanding access to uh, vaccines for all families. It's why we've launched for four to 11-year-olds uh, a vaccine program that so far leads the nation with roughly one in four of these elementary students already one dose. That's incredible progress by any measurement, but we know there's more work to do. For our high school students, we're at over 80 percent double vaccinated. We have one of the highest rates of immunization in the nation. We are proud of that. Also, in addition to high rates of vaccination, we have, Speaker, one of the lowest case rates for youth under 19. We have done that through ventilation, through three-ply quality masks, through expanded testing options, and with respect to the ongoing work, we've announced an additional $304 million expansion of testing, rapid antigen and PCR take-home tests, which are making a difference to ensure our families, our communities and our educators remain safe this holiday. Thank you very much. That concludes our question period. Um, I'm going to first recognize the member for Ottawa South. Thank you very much, Speaker. Uh, point of order. Uh, I have some news that's really exciting and also kind of sad. So uh, many of you know Grace Johnson, who's my executive assistant. So the exciting part is she's going to be leaving my office on an adventure that she's been planning for a long time. And Grace is, um, I just want to say this out loud because I think you all know this because she knows more people than I do in here. Wherever Grace is, she lifts up everybody around her. I can't, don't have enough time to say all the things that she's done to support me uh, and all of us. And uh, she's just a wonderful person. Uh, I'm sad to see her go, but really happy at the same time. So it's kind of a, a weird time. So, you know, I used to say to Grace, you know, I get up every morning and I pray for Grace. And when I get here, when I get to the office, you're here. Sadly, that's not going to be the case in the new year, unless, of course, I find a new Grace, which is highly unlikely, uh, because she's not replaceable. And uh, I just want to say thank you to Grace. And she's right over there. I made her, I made her come down. And say, Okay, um, member for Scarborough Guildwood on a point of order. A speaker, um, if, if I just beg the indulgence of the House Speaker, but I would like to wish my nephew Jordan, Oscar, Isaac, Hunter a happy first birthday tomorrow. Minister of the Environment, Conservation and Parks on a point of order. Uh, thank you, Speaker. I too would like to rise on a, a point of order with uh, exciting yet sad news uh, for me. Um, Speaker, I've had the honour of working uh, with my executive assistant, Paige Wiggins, uh, since pretty much first getting elected. And as a new MPP, it's been exciting to tackle the challenges of elected life, uh, but I've done so with confidence in having uh, Paige by my side uh, from day one. She's about to embark on a new exciting adventure, which I was just told about a few days ago. And, uh, and I wish her nothing but the best. She's been a remarkable asset, and I have not been able to do my job, and the people of Northumberland, uh, Peterborough South, have been better served having uh, Paige in our constituency office. So Paige, Merry Christmas, wishing you the best of luck in uh, your future endeavors, and we're sad to see you go. Thanks, Speaker.
Member for Bruce Gray on sound. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And I'd like to also uh, congratulate Grace on all that she's done. And she stood here as a, the epitome, frankly, as a staffer that goes beyond the partisan stuff. She's always bubbly. She's always personal. She certainly made John Fraser look a lot better and do a lot better things in this house. But we could all learn from, from Grace to, to go across the aisle, to do the right things, to do the proper things, and not be partisan overboard. Yes, we have a job to do. Grace, you've been a great colleague, a great ally, a great friend. We wish you all the well. Uh, Ontario's loss is certainly England's gain. So all the very best in your future endeavors. Government House Leader has a point of order. <laughs> yeah, this will be very underwhelming, uh, Mr. Speaker. I'm rising on uh, point of order, standing order uh, 58, uh, to outline the uh, status of business. First, to say that uh, there will be no night sitting this evening, Mr. Speaker. Um, it's good. And when we come back uh, in February, Speaker, we will, of course, be dealing with uh, a motion that we have tabled with respect to the exciting broadcast uh, standards uh, of this place based on the hard work of the Legislative Assembly Committee. And uh, before we leave, too, uh, Speaker, I, I would be remiss if I didn't thank you, uh, the uh, clerk, and deputy clerk, and the table officers, uh, the sergeant at arms, all of the security and peace officers uh, who have uh, kept this place. Uh, very, very safe uh, throughout all of this, Mr. Speaker. I, too, uh, have uh, come to know uh, Grace very well, and she's uh, uh, been an incredible, incredible asset, uh, especially when we were learning our job in the beginning, quite, uh, quite frankly, Mr. Speaker, uh, uh, and they never were shy in, in helping us out. But also, uh, Bianca in, uh, in, Minister, in Mr. Schreiner's uh, office, uh, as well as uh, Jasmine and, and Kevin in the opposition leader's uh, house office. Uh, and of course, my own team, Patrick Kelly, who sits here uh, and, uh, uh, and is riveted by how exciting this place is all of the time. And, uh, <laughs> Um, uh, and of course, uh, Cha who's uh, who's now here uh, all the time listening. Uh, Owen in my office, uh, Monica in uh, in my office, uh, uh, Rachel in my office, all do a tremendous work. Uh, uh, speaker, and of course, I too am losing uh, my chief of staff for a short period of time. Uh, she uh, has been here, Jessica Lippert, for a very long time. You all know her. Uh, she is uh, going to be leaving on maternity leave very soon. Uh, I was thinking, Mr. Speaker, of asking for unanimous consent that we order her to call her child Paul Calandra uh, <laughs> Lawson, but I suspect the House would not agree to that, so uh, I won't go down that road. And finally, uh, Speaker, just to, uh, to say very Merry Christmas, uh, Happy Holidays, Seasons Greetings to everybody here. It is, uh, uh, none of us uh, signed up for what we've had to go through over the last number of, uh, of, uh, of months, but uh, I would think that all members of Parliament, even the ones that I very much disagree with, have risen to the occasion and represent their communities uh, very, very well, Mr. Speaker, and it is an absolute honour to serve with all of you. Thank you. The, board, the member for Timiskaming Cochrane. On behalf of the official opposition, I would like to congratulate Jess and make it very clear that I would say no to that unanimous consent motion. <laughs> um, but on behalf of the official opposition, I would like to uh, thank everyone for all the work they do and for the people we don't see, like the people in the cafeteria every morning. I fight very hard for that place. And, and the people who ask, this, ask us the seven questions every morning. And the people, sometimes we're here a bit late at night, and the people who come to clean our offices. And I, I would like to say, once in a while, we're still there when they come. And we, we, I love this place about, because we all have such different backgrounds, and I love it when our speeches are talked about our different backgrounds. But please take the opportunity, and I'm sure we all have, to ask the people where they come from, the people who clean your office, the people. It's amazing what this province and this country has offered. We have issues here to fix, but we live in an amazing place, and we're about to enter into an amazing season. And we have our differences, and that will continue to happen, and the fact that we can, at least most of the time, try and settle these differences uh, um, amicably, is that the right word? <laughs> and I'd like to close by, uh, I never look good, but the people who try, Kevin and Jasmine, <laughs> they, they, they have a hard job. We all have a hard job. 
but Merry Christmas and Happy New Year. Thank you. Thank you. It's now time to once again ask the pages to assemble. Our pages are hardworking, trustworthy, and smart. They are indispensable to all that goes on in this chamber, and we are indeed fortunate to have them here. Our pages will now go home having made new friends, with a better understanding of parliamentary democracy, and with memories that will last them a lifetime. In the coming years, each of them will continue their studies and, in time, contribute to their communities, their province, and their country in important ways. And who knows? Maybe some of them will someday take their seats in this House as members or, or as staff, and we wish all of them well. It's been wonderful to have Pages back in the chamber this fall, and I want to ask all members to please join me in showing our appreciation for this great group of legislative Pages. Thank you very much. Before I call the votes, I want to express my sincere thanks to all of you, the members of the 42nd Provincial Parliament of Ontario, as well as all the staff who inform and support the work that we do. We know that we are privileged to be elected, to be here. We are all, staff and members alike, empowered by the virtue of democracy. We exercise the authority granted to us by the people, and we are accountable to them. We apply our best judgment to the challenges we face, and we seek to encourage, to inspire, and to lead. But that is not enough. Our collective vision must extend beyond the current electoral cycle, past the challenging decade that we find ourselves in, past even the next generation. And it is in that spirit that we should reflect upon Garrett Noddy's magnificent carving above the main entrance to the chamber, illustrating with gentle simplicity but overwhelming power the seven grandfather teachings. The eagle, meaning love, unconditional and freely given. The beaver, meaning wisdom, for the good of all people. The turtle, meaning truth, so that we never deceive. The bison, meaning respect, mutual and re reciprocal. The wolf, meaning humility, knowing we are all equal, none better than another. The raven, meaning honesty in all our words and actions. And the bear, meaning courage, to face down your adversaries with integrity and seek to do the right thing, no matter what the consequences. All freely given to all of us at this seat of Parliament here by the Anishinaabe peoples, who were here for centuries before settlers arrived. Timeless, yes. Enlightening, yes. Perfect for any governing authority, including a provincial parliament like ours, yes. And as this year comes to a close, our hearts are filled with gratitude for the people of Ontario who have demonstrated enormous resilience and perseverance, extraordinary caring and compassion, love, wisdom, truth, respect, humility, honesty, and above all, courage. God bless us, everyone, at Christmas. We now have a deferred vote on the motion for closure on the motion for third reading of Bill 43, an act to implement budget measures and to enact and amend various statutes. On December 7, 2021, Mr. Bethlehem Falvey moved third reading of Bill 43. On December 8, 2021, Ms. Kusindova moved that the question be now put. The bells will now ring for 30 minutes, during which time members may cast their votes on Ms. Ms. Kusindova's motion that the question be now put. And I will ask the clerks to please prepare the lines. <laughs>